Hello, hello. Welcome to another episode of Read With Me. I'm yours truly, Isabel Bedell, and I'm here to read with you another amazing chapter on the 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership by John C. Maxwell. And I'm really, really excited to cover Law of Navigation, chapter number four today. And I'm so pumped about this because the previous law that we went over was all about the law of process. And just to give you a little taste of what that was, if you haven't already seen the amazing, amazing read with me that was posted, this is the quote that, oh, it hit me like a ton of bricks, you know? It goes like this. When the action starts, you're down to your reflexes. That's where your road work shows. If you cheated in the dark of that morning, you're getting found under the bright lights. That was a quote by heavyweight champ, Joe Frazier. And it's all about making the strides daily, putting in that work daily, putting in that learned daily, and making sure that you're infusing yourself with the right tools, with the right mindset, with the right leadership, so you can grow and prosper. It's not about being microwave society or being, you know, instant gratification, being part of that. It's all about how long can you sustain yourself? How long are you able to sustain your leadership, your influence? that process, mm. how long? Well, the law of navigation, it starts off with anyone can steer the ship, but it takes a leader to chart the course. And I'm freaking stoked about this because I'm all about like, you know, planning. Um, I really enjoy being able to map out and strategize and you know, create this big vision and then ch put it into many chunks and then have milestones to achieve those things. So let's see how this works out. Have a good, good feeling about the law of navigation. Let's get into it, shall we? In 1911, two groups of explorers set off on an incredible mission. And though they used different strategies and routes, the leaders of the teams had the same goal to be the first in history to reach the South Pole. Their stories are life and death illustrations of the law of navigation. One group was led by Norwegian explorer, Roald Emerson. Ironically, Emerson had not originally intended to go to Antarctica. His desire was to be the first man to reach the North Pole. But when he discovered that Robert Peary had beaten him there, Emerson changed his goal and headed toward the other end of the earth. North or South, he knew his planning would pay off. Emerson carefully charted his course. And before his team ever set off, Emerson had painstakingly planned his trip. He studied the methods of the Eskimos and other experience and other experienced Ar Arctic travelers and determined that the best course of action would be to transport all the equipment by supplies by dog sled. And when he assembled his team, he chose expert skiers and dog handlers. His strategy was simple. The dogs would do most of the work as the group traveled 15 to 20 miles in the six hour period each day. That would afford both the dogs and the men plenty of time for their daily rest prior to the following day's travel. Emerson's forethought and attention to detail were incredible. He located the stock supply depots, depots all along the intended route, the way they would not have to carry every bit of their supplies with them the whole trip. And he also equipped his people with the best gear possible. Emerson had carefully considered every possible aspect of the journey, though through and through, thought and through, and planned accordingly, and it paid off. The worst problem they experienced on the trip was an infected tooth that one man had to be that had to be extra extracted. It wasn't, wow, that was like kind of random. Hmm, 
but Scott violated the law of the navigation. Ooh, 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 ooh. Okay, Scott. Scott violated the law of navigation. The other team of people was led by Robert Bakken Scott, a British naval officer who had previously done some exploring in the Arctic area. Scott's expedition with the anti-thesis of Emerson's. Instead of using dog sleds, Scott decided to go motorized sledges and ponies. Their problems began when the motors on the sledges stopped working only five days into the trip and the ponies didn't fare well either in the frigid temperatures and when they reached the foot of the trans-Antarctic mountains, all of the poor animals had to be killed. As a result, the team members themselves ended up hauling the 200 pound sledges. It was arduous work. Scott hadn't given up enough attention to the team's other equipment either. Their clothes were so poorly designed that all of the men developed frostbite. One team member required an hour every morning just to get his boots into his swollen, grannous feet. Oh, everyone became snowblind because of the inadequate goggles Scott had supplied. On top of everything else, the team was always low on food and water, and that was also due to Scott's poor planning. The depots of supplies Scott established were inadequately stocked and too far apart and often poorly marked, which made them very difficult to find. Because they were continuously low on fuel to melt snow, everyone became dehydrated and making things even worse was Scott's last minute decision to take along, to take along a fifth man, even though they had prepared enough supplies for only four. After covering the grueling 800 miles in 10 weeks, Scott's exhausted group finally arrived at the South Pole on January 17, 1912. And that's where they found the Norwegian flag flapping in the wind in a letter from the Emerson. The other well-led team had beaten them their goal by more than a month. Ooh. Dang. If you don't live by the law of navigation, dot, dot, dot. Scott's expedition to the pole is a classic example of a leader who could not navigate for his people. But the trek back was even worse. Scott and his men were starving and suffering from scurvy, yet Scott was unable to navigate to the very end and was obviously to their plight. With time running out and the food supply desperately low, Scott insisted that they collect 30 pounds of geological specimen to take back and more weight to be carried by the worn out men. The group's progress became slower and slower. One member of the party sank into a stupor and died. Another Lawrence Oates, a former army officer who had originally been brought along to take care of the ponies, had frostbite so severe that he had trouble doing anything. And because he believed he was endangering the team's survival, he purposely walked into the blizzard to keep from hindering the group. And before he left the tent, and headed into the storm, he said, I'm just going to go outside and maybe some time. Wow. Scott and his final team members made it only a little farther north before giving up. The return trip had already taken two months and still they were 150 miles from their base camp. There they died. We know their story only because they spent their last hours updating their diaries. Some of Scott's last words were, were these. We shall die like gentlemen. I think this will show the spirit of pluck and power to endure has not passed out of our race. Scott had courage, but not leadership. And because he was unable to live by the law of navigation, he and his companions died by it. Followers need leaders able to effectively navigate for them. Followers need leaders able to effectively navigate for them. When they're facing life and death situations, the necessity, the necessity is painfully obvious. But even when consequences aren't as serious, the need is also great. The truth is, that nearly anyone can steer the ship, but it takes a leader to chart the course.
the that is the law of navigation. Navigators see the trip ahead. Former General Electric Chairman Jack Welsh asserts, a good leader remains focused. Controlling your direction is better than being controlled by it. Welch is right, but leaders who navigate do even more than control the direction in which they and their people travel. They see the whole trip in their minds before they leave the dock. They have vision for getting to their destination. They understand what it will take to get there, and they know they'll need on the team to be successful. And they also recognize the obstacles long before they appear on the horizon. Lee Roy Ames. Eames, author of the Be the Leader You Were Meant to Be writes, a leader is one who sees more than others see, who sees farther than others see, and who sees before others do. The larger the organization, the more clearly the leader has to be able to see ahead. That's true because sheer size makes need mid-course corrections more difficult. And if there are errors in navigation, many more people are affected than when a leader is traveling alone or with only a few people. The disaster shows in James Cameron's 1997 film Titanic, which was a good example of that kind of problem. The crew could not see far enough ahead to avoid the iceberg altogether, and they could not maneuver enough to change the course once the object was in view because the size of the ship. The result was that more than 1,000 people lost their lives. This is where the leader goes. First-rate navigators always have in mind that other people are depending on them and their ability to chart a good course. I read an observation by James Autry in Life and Work, a manager search for meaning that illustrates this idea. He writes that occasionally, you hear about the crash of four military planes flying together in a formation. The reason for the loss of all four is this. When jet fighters fly in groups of four, one pilot, the leader, designates where the team will fly. The other three planes fly in the leader's wing, watching him and following him wherever he goes. Whatever moves he makes, the rest of his team will make along with him. And that's true, whether he soars in the clouds or smashes into a mountaintop. Before good leaders take their people on a good journey, they go through a process in order to give the trip the best chance of success. Navigators draw on past experience. Navigators draw on past experience. So every past success and failure you've experienced can be a valuable source of information and wisdom if you allow it to be. Success teaches you what you're capable of doing and gives you confidence. However, your failures often teach greater lessons. They reveal wrong assumptions, character flaws, errors in judgment, and poor working methods. So ironically, Many people hate their failures so much that they quickly cover them up instead of analyzing them and learning from them. And as I explained in my book, Failing Forward, if you fail to learn from your mistakes, you're going to fail again and again and again. Hmm. Why do I even mention something that seems so basic? Well, because most leaders are activists. They tend to look forward, not backward. They make decisions and move on. And I know this because that is my tendency. But for leaders to become good navigators, they need to take time to reflect and learn from their experiences. That's why I have developed the discipline of reflective thinking. I write about it in detail in my book, Thinking for the Change, but Allow me to give you some advantages of reflective thinking here. Reflective thinking. It gives you true perspective. It gives you emotional integrity to your thought life. It increases your confidence in decision making. It clarifies the big picture. And it takes a good experience and it makes it a valuable experience. Each benefit gives you a leader 
Each benefit gives a leader a great advantage when planning next steps for a team or organization. Each of the benefits that I just listed above, perspective, emotional integrity, confidence, decision-making, clarifying a big picture, good experience, and how it makes it a valuable experience. Beautiful, I love that. Navigators examine the conditions before making commitments. Drawing on experience means looking inward. Examining conditions means looking outward. No good leader plans a course of action without paying close attention to current conditions. That would be like setting sail against the tide or plotting a course into a hurricane. Good navigators count the costs before making commitments for themselves and others. They examine not only measurable factors such as finances, resources, and talent, but also intangibles such as timing, morale, momentum, culture, and so on. And I'll discuss this more in the laws of intuition and timing. Navigators listen to what others have to say. No matter how much you learn from the past, it will never tell you all that you need to know for the present. Ooh, that's a good line. No matter how much you learn from the past, it will never tell you what you need to know for the present. No matter how good a leader you are, you yourself will not have all the answers. That's why it's top notch navigators are the ones that gather information from many sources. So for example, Roald Amelson expedition to the South Pole, he had learned from a group of Native Americans in Canada about warm clothing and Arctic survival techniques. Those skills and practices meant the difference between failure and success for this team in Antarctica. Beautiful. Navigating leaders get ideas from many sources. They listen to members of the, their leadership team. They talk to people in their organization to find out what's happening on the grassroots level. And they spend time with leaders from outside of the organization who can mentor them. They always think in terms of relying on a team, not just themselves. Navigators make sure their conclusions represent both faith and fact. Being able to navigate for others requires a leader to possess a positive attitude. You've got to have faith that you can take your people all the way. If you can't confidently make the trip in your mind, you're not going to be able to take it to real life. On the other hand, you also have to be able to see the facts realistically. You can't minimize obstacles or rationalize your challenges and still lead effectively. You, if you don't go in with your eyes wide open, you're going to get blindsided. And as Bill Asim, President of Asim, Bandy and Associates observes, realistic leaders are objective enough to minimize illusions. They understand that self-deception can cost them their vision. Mm. Jim Collins confirmed this balance between the faith between faith and fact in his 2001 book, Good to Great. He calls it the Stockdale Paradox. He writes, you must retain faith and you will prevail in the end. And you must also confront the most brutal facts of your current reality, balancing optimism and realism, intuition and planning, faith and fact can be very difficult, but that's what it takes to be effective as a navigating leader. I remember the first time I really understood the importance of the law of navigation. This is John's lesson in navigation, by the way. He was 28 years old and he was leading the second church in his pastoral career. He mentions, before my arrival there in 1972, the church had experienced a decade long plateau in its growth. And by 1975, our attendance had gone from 400 to more than 1,000. I knew we could keep growing and helping more people, but only if we built a new auditorium. The good news was that I had already had some experience leading a construction project because I had taken my first church through that process. The bad news was that the first one was really small in comparison to the second one. This was going to be a multi-million dollar project, more than 20 times larger than the first one. But even that was not the greatest obstacle. Right before I came on board as a leader of the church, there had been a huge battle over another building proposal. And that debate had been vocal. 
divisive and bitter. And for that reason, I knew that I would experience genuine opposition to my leadership for the first time. There were rough waters ahead. And if I, as a leader, didn't navigate us well, I could sink the ship. Charting the course with a navigation strategy. I should probably confess that at this point that I was not a strong navigator. I don't take joy in getting into details and I tend to go with my gut instinct and sometimes a little too quickly for my own good. In the last 15 to 20 years, I've often stopped my weakness and hired good navigating leaders to help my organizations. That's, that's everything right there. I've stopped my weakness and hired good navigating leaders to help my organizations. So for example, for many years when I was a church leader, Dan Reland was on my staff of executive pastors. He's an excellent navigator, currently at Equip, the nonprofit organization I founded in 1996. John Hole works as its president, and he is a fantastic navigating leader. However, Back in 1975, I had taken the responsibility for the navigation process myself. And to help me do that, I developed a strategy that I have used repeatedly in my leadership. I wrote it as an arrow stick acrostic. I wrote it as an acrostic so that I could always, always be able to remember it. And it's plan ahead. Okay, plan ahead. P stands for predetermine a course of action. L stands for lay out your goals. A, adjust your priorities. N, notify key personnel. A, allow time for acceptance. That's plan, okay? And then A, allow time for acceptance. H, head into action. E, expect problems. A, always point to the success, and D, daily review your plan, plan ahead. That became my blueprint as I became prepared to navigate this change for my organization. I had a strong sense of what our course of action needed to be. If we were going to keep growing, we needed to build a new auditorium. I had looked at every possible alternative and I knew that there was only a viable solution. My goal was to design and build the facility, pay for it in 10 years and unify all the people in the process, no small fee. Any plan I introduced would have to be voted on in a congregational meeting. So I scheduled one a couple of months ahead of time so I can get everything ready. And the next thing that I did was direct our board of members and a group of key financial leaders to conduct a 20 year analysis of our growth and financial patterns. It covered the previous 10 years of projections for the next 10 years. And based on that, we determined that the requirements of the facility. When we then formulated a 10 year budget that carefully explained how we could handle financing. I also asked that all of the information we were gathering be put into a 20 page report to be given to the members of the congregation. I knew the major barriers to successful planning are fear of change, ignorance, and uncertainty about the future. Also lack of imagination. Ooh, this right here is huge, right here. I knew that major barriers of successful planning. What are the major, what are the major barriers to successful planning? Well, they are fear to change, ignorance, uncertainty about the future, and the lack of imagination. Mm, powerful. I was going to do everything that I could to prevent those factors from hindering us. So the next step was to notify all of the key leaders. I started with the ones who had the most influence, meeting with them individually, and sometimes in small groups. Over the course of several weeks, I met with about 100 leaders. I cast the vision for what we needed to do and fielded their questions. And any time I could sense that a person was hesitant about the project, I planned to meet individually. I planned to meet individually with him again. Then I allowed time for those key leaders to influence the rest of the people and help them accept the coming changes. When the time arrived for the congregational meeting, we were ready to head into action. 
I took two hours to present the project to the people. I handed out my 20 page report with the floor plans, financial analysis and budgets. I tried to answer every question the people would have before they had even a chance to ask it. I also asked some of the most influential people in the congregation to speak. I had expected opposition, but when I opened the door for questions, I was shocked. There were only two questions. One person wanted to know about the placement of the building's water fountains, and the other asked about the number of restrooms. That was when I knew we had navigated the tricky waters successfully. And when it was time for the motion, asking everyone to vote, the church's most influential layperson made it. And I had already asked the leader who had previously opposed the building project to be the one to second that motion. When the final count was tallied, 98% of the people had voted in favor. Wow. Once we navigated through this tricky part of the process, the rest of the project was pretty straightforward. I continually kept the vision in front of the people by giving them good news reports. I made sure we celebrated successes and I periodically reviewed our plans and their results to make sure we were on track. The course had been charted. All we had to do was steer the ship. That was a beautiful, wonderful learning experience for me. And above everything else, I found out that the secret to the law of navigation is preparation. When you prepare well, you convey confidence and trust, trust to people. You convey confidence and trust to people. Lack of preparation has the opposite effect. In the end, it's not the size of the project that determines its acceptance, support, or success. It's the size of the leader. That's why I say that anyone can steer the ship, but it takes a leader to chart the course. Leaders who are good navigators are capable of taking their people just about anywhere. Ooh. That line is freaking good. And I love this course of action right here because I'm in the process of doing this myself. I'm now building a church. I'm not building a physical location, but we are structuring an amazing three-year plan for our business. And if our goal for our other business, I believe is to impact the lives of 1 million entrepreneurs, I mean, we've currently, to date, we've worked with over a thousand coaches, which is amazing, right? 1,000, over 1,000. But if our goal is to impact the lives of 1 million, which is 100x of that, how, do, how can we do that in the same amount of time that it took us to do 1,000? You know, how do we do that? So that's the that is the course that needs to be charted, that needs to be implemented, and that needs to be executed on. So wow, this chapter can have come in a better time. Here is how applying the law of navigation can be used into your life. Three points again. Do you make it a regular practice to reflect on your positive and negative experience? And if not, you will miss the potential lessons they have to offer. Do one of the two things. Set aside a time to reflect every week. Examine your calendar or your journal to jog your memory. Build reflection time into your schedule immediately after major success or failure. In either case, write down what you learned during that discovery process. Navigating leaders do their homework. For some, project or major task that you are currently responsible for, draw on your past experience, hold intentional conversations with experts and team members to gather information and examine current conditions that could impact the success of your endeavor. Only after taking these steps should you create your action plan. Which way do you naturally lean? Towards facts or faith? Rarely, is a leader especially talented in both areas. I'm a faith person, I'm a highly visionary and believe that anything is possible. And I often rely on my brother, Larry, to help me with realistic thinking. And yet 
good navigators must be able to do both. To successfully practice the law of navigation, you must know your own bent. If you're not sure, as trusted friends and colleagues, then make sure you have someone with the opposite bent on your team so that you can work together. Johnny Pooh coming in hot. I love it. I love it. I love it. This was an amazing chapter once again. I love that he mentions that he's like a faith person. He's highly visionary and believes that anything is possible. I truly associate myself in that column heavily. Um, I'm grateful that I have Vanessa on my side because she is a beast when it comes to you know, execution and details and making sure that everything actually goes according to plan and holds people accountable, which is amazing. You know, she's incredible. Make sure to check out her videos if you aren't. It's all about personal freedom and she is the master about personal freedom. I'm so grateful for this and I hope you got a lot of value out of it. I know there's so much more to come and guess what? The next law that we're gonna be talking about is the law of addition, adding value by serving others. So if you're in a position right now where you're looking to elevate your life, your leadership, your relationships, your business, your income, your impact, all of that, welcome to the solution. I'll see you in the next video because it's going to be a good one. And I hope you got a lot of value. Once again, make sure to hit subscribe, make sure to hit like, make sure to share with a friend and make sure to live on purpose. Ladies and gentlemen, you got one life. Make it a real one. Bye.